Bibles to James chapter 4. Boy, you took my introduction away by having everybody talk about what I've preached this week. Um, but just in case you didn't get the full impact, really our burden this week is to live up to what God expects of us. We took a look on Sunday morning at the fact that if we were to uh, measure up in every way except for the area of love, we would fail God's test. We can have everything else in place. We can be in Bible college training for the ministry, looking like we're the sharpest one in our class. We can be a senior saint who loves the Lord Jesus with all of his heart. We can be a mom of a whole gaggle of kids. We can be uh, someone who's been saved, uh, has a remarkable testimony of salvation. We can be doing it all right, going to the right church, using the right Bible, preaching the right message, saying it in a way that's accurate. We can be believing God, expecting great things from him. But if we do not have love, we are nothing. We are failures in God's eyes and really we're not meeting God's expectations. We saw in the list of verbs there, and again, I, I'm saying this because I want to burn this into our hearts here this week. Uh, Paul said essentially to belabor something. Uh, listen, it is for you safe, okay? And, you know, when we look at our lives, oftentimes instead of seeing love, that perspective that has the good of others, that, that prioritizes the good of others over and above that which is good for my art. Ourselves, when we do not have that love, instead what we are doing is we are prioritizing self over the good of others. And we saw that that is selfishness. Great summary to Sunday morning's message. The word selfishness. Even though it was a message on love, he got it right. It really was a message on selfishness if the truth were to be known. And as these, as we've gone through the sermons for, uh, over the last couple of uh, nights here, we've taken a look at how selfishness manifests itself in our lives. We saw on Sunday night that selfishness hides sin. Selfishness doesn't want to know what happened in secret. Selfishness does not want to come clean. Instead, selfishness does everything it can to keep that sin hidden underneath of our tent, so to speak. We looked at Joshua chapter 7. Last night, we looked at the fact that selfishness, like a black hole, has a gravitational force that draws offenses to itself and those offenses get lodged in our souls and they end up creating that root of bitterness that troubles our soul and troubles our relationships. Selfishness hides sin. Selfishness harbors resentment. But love comes clean and love forgives. And here this evening, I want to deal with another aspect of selfishness here tonight. But before I even tell you what specifically it is, I just want you to know that tonight is going to be a little bit different than the last couple nights. Because really tonight, though I am for sure going to make a lot of applications, what I'm after here this evening is not any one application. Really what I'm after here this evening is what you might call a presupposition or a foundation. See, every one of us in our lives, we have something that is resting underneath of our choices, our decisions, the way we think and the way we act. And that which stands under our choices and priorities, I very much believe, is our presuppositions. And here tonight, I want to take a look at the kind of presuppositions that selfishness often has for itself in the day-to-day -day choices of life. Uh, we're going to be looking at James chapter 4 here in just a minute, but I want to go to the Lord before we dive into our text in prayer here. Lord God in heaven, I do present myself to you anew and afresh. I not only declare my weakness here tonight, I want to, like Paul, rejoice in my weakness. I want to glory in my weakness because here tonight, I don't want anyone here to see what I can do, 
to see what kind of message I can spin up, Lord, tonight. I want the power of Christ to rest upon me. And so I thank you, Father, for my weakness, and I thank you for the fact that you can and you will fill me with the very life, love, and power of Jesus Christ by your Holy Spirit. I take right now the anointing and the unction from the Holy One that I need to preach in a way that will help and change hearts. So, Lord God in heaven, I do ask that you would not only fill me with the Holy Ghost, would you fill these folks with the Holy Ghost also so they can hear and understand and apply and live what they're going to hear tonight. I love you. Please bless this meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. Foundations are very important. Jesus made that very clear. If someone's life, his choices are built upon the rock, that is a solid foundation. But he, Jesus also made it very clear that if you build your house upon the sand, it doesn't matter how uh, beautiful that house might look. It doesn't matter how stable those walls might appear. It doesn't matter how many decorations are on that house. It doesn't matter how much you might consider that house a home. The fact of the matter is, if you build a house on a faulty foundation, while at first it might seem to stand, it will eventually crumble, and you could say the experience will not be that which you are seeking. Uh, we had an interesting discovery today when it comes to foundations. We were driving on our way back from the zoo, driving right by the, uh, the track where the Indianapolis 500 takes place, when all of a sudden, as we're driving, we hear boom, 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 boom. Yes, I felt something going on. We pulled over literally right by those concrete barriers, right over there, and I get out and I turn around, and you know what? We had blown a tire. You ever think about the foundation of a vehicle? It's these four rubber round things, these four rubber donuts that come into contact with the road. Really, if one, even if you can have three perfectly good ones, but if one of those goes bad, it really ruins the driving experience, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Well, thankfully, we had a donut and we were able to make it back here this evening. But I discovered that foundations are important. The foundation for my vehicle is important. The foundation of your home is important. And really, tonight, I want to argue that the foundation for your life, your decisions, your priorities is incredibly important. Listen, I recognize that the fact that many of you, by the very fact that you are here tonight, are showing that something that's important important to you is to hear the preaching of the Word of God. And I want to commend you for being here in a revival service on Tuesday night. I want to commend these young men for being here on Tuesday night. They're not even a part of this church, and yet they're here because they want to hear what God has to say for them. But listen, just like in a vehicle, you can have three good tires, but if one of them goes bad, it can really ruin the experience and I want to argue, though many of us, I believe, want to base our lives on the Word of God, and many of us understand how important preaching is for the work that God wants to do in your life, I would argue that many believers, though they come to church, though they dress the way they ought to dress and act the way they ought to, ought to act, though they might have much in place as far as the priorities of their life, I would argue that this one matter that I want to speak to about here tonight, as far as I've observed in churches and even in my own children's lives, if this foundation is off, it will totally wreck and ruin your Christian experience. James chapter 4 and verse number 1, here the scripture says this, from whence come wars and fightings among you. That kind of sounds like what we talked about last night, right? Why is it that we find ourselves with this horizontal conflict? We talked about a root, a, a possible cause for that to be the case. And, and listen, that sermon still applies. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon. But here in this passage, James asks the question, and then he gives an answer, and look at what he says. Where do these wars and fightings come from in our lives? He says, come they not hence, even of your, what's the next word? Lusts, which war 
in your members. Now, if you're at all would consider yourself a Bible student, a student of the Bible, if you've done any studying on this word lust or lusts in the New Testament, you might think that you know what that word lusts is talking about. In fact, if you've done any study of the word lust, you might be thinking of the word uh, that has to do with an appetite or a desire. In other words, we in our hearts and in our lives, we have desires desires for things. And you know what? Desires are absolutely essential for life. If you did not have desires, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. If you didn't have desires, you wouldn't have a job. If you didn't have certain desires, you wouldn't get married. If you didn't have desires, you wouldn't do anything. You would sit like a bump on a log doing absolutely nothing. That'd be a very miserable existence. God has wired us to desire certain things, and the fact that we have desires is not a problem. But it's all about what those desires are focused on. Here in this verse, he doesn't use the normal word that we would typically expect when it comes for the word lusts. This word is a very surprising word. In fact, I'd been preaching out of this text and, and, and many of the verses, especially the revival passage you have up here on your wall, I've been preaching some of these verses for a long time, but it was just this past March when I was preparing to preach on these texts that I did a little bit more study and I came to a discovery that frankly totally changed how I approach this text of Scripture. I found that this word lusts has to do not so much with the desires of our hearts, not so much with the fact that we want stuff or want things or, or, or uh, have strong desires, whether they be good or evil. The idea of this word is a much more specific kind of desire. In fact, I normally don't like to bring up the Greek in the pulpit, but the actual Greek word here is the word hedone, and it relates directly to the word hedonism. You ever heard of that word, hedonism? Hedonism is a life philosophy. Um, there were many men, particularly back in ancient Greek, who adopted this life philosophy and essentially hedonism said this that the purpose of life is to experience as much pleasure as possible in fact that life philosophy essentially says that the pursuit of pleasure is the reason why we exist and you know, here in this verse, he makes this statement. He says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts. And the kind of lust that he's talking about here is not just the desire to get a job, not just the desire to accomplish the idea of this word. Well, I'll put it to you this way. Here's what one lexicon said about this word. It said, it is something or someone that provides a source of happiness. What is it that causes conflict in our lives? What is it that causes us to war and fight amongst each other? He said, here's the problem. There are things in your life that you are pursuing. And the things that you're pursuing are things that make you happy. You know, I want to argue here this evening that, yes, presuppositions are the foundation of our choices and our priority, but James here in this passage is trying to bring these presuppositions to the surface to show us that the pursuit of pleasure is going to lead us to conflict to disappointment, and ultimately to spiritual frustration. You see, what James is calling us to do, I believe in this passage, is he's calling us to grapple not just with what we are doing, but he's calling us to grapple with why it is that we are doing what we are doing. Because you see, each one of us make a thousand choices every day, and those choices are based upon something. And if you and I live our lives pursuing that which makes us happy, I want you to know it's not going to work. 
the way that we think it's going to work. Let me put it this way, to put this topic in the context of our theme. Selfishness lives for pleasure, but true love lives for God and for others. A couple observations that I want to give you out of this passage here this evening. Here, James, he asks this question, from whence come wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lusts, which war in your members. And I just want to say this, there are different lusts that each one of us have. Remember, the lust as defined here in this verse is that which brings something or someone that brings you happiness. And I want to make this statement, show me what brings you happiness and I'll show you what brings you conflict. Let me say that again. Show me what brings you happiness and I'll show you what also brings you conflict. Listen, if I was to ask you all to just for a moment think about what the good life would be like. If you could have your way this evening after the service is done, what would an evening between the time when you get home and the time that you pill your head at night, what would that time look like? What would the perfect vacation to you look like? If you could have your way in your classes, in your dormitory, what would it look like? If you could have your way in your workplace, what would it look like? If you could orchestrate the details, every last detail of your life, what would it be that brings you happiness? Some of you might think, well, you know what? I think what would bring me happiness is if I could buy such and such a thing. And we can think, you know what? If I could just buy such and such a thing, then I'll be happy. Some folks might think, well, you know what? If I could just have such and such a kind of relationship with someone, then I would truly be happy. Some might say, well, you know what? If I could find myself in such and such a position in my workplace, or perhaps even some of these young men training for the ministry, they can think, well, if I could just be in a pastorate, if I could just be in a pastorate, that would be the good life. Some might think if my kids just would stop doing that, that would be the good life, right? If, uh, if my spouse would just do things the way I really want her to do things, that would be the good life in our, our minds. We have a certain way that we would like things to be, and if we could just get stuff to be like that, it would make us happy. And the challenge here is sometimes those things aren't necessarily wrong. Listen, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a particular vehicle. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that it's wrong to own a boat. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying that it's wrong. It's a good thing if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. Listen, I'm not saying that it's wrong for you to want your children to behave. I'm not saying it's wrong to aspire towards a particular position. But here's the point I'm trying to make. He asked this question, where do the wars and fightings come from? Don't they come out of your own desire for something or someone that brings you happiness. I want you to think about this. So you've got a particular ideal in mind, something that you want to get out of life. You know what happens when people begin to stand between you and that ideal? Oh, it doesn't look good. That oftentimes brings great conflict in the dormitory when you just want a quiet time for devotions. And that dumb guy in the dorm who doesn't know how to keep his mouth shut steps in your way. That's what happens when as a mother or a father with small children, you are so glad to have the kids to bed because after they're in bed, that's when you can really get to what you're trying to get after at night. Whether that's some me time on your phone, whether that's some time to get some project, get into some project that you really can't get into while the little ones are awake and loose. And then you know how it is, you get going down the way and then you hear, Mama, I wet the bed. <laughs> or I need something to drink, or something like that. And you know what that can cause? Conflict, 
conflict. You know, <clears throat> show me what brings you pleasure, and I'll show you what brings you conflict. You know, maybe that which brings you pleasure is to keep your car in immaculate condition. And you know, you, man, you not only clean that thing and wash that thing and wax that thing, but you have taken such care to park in the far end of the parking lot everywhere you go. You've taken such care to park it in the garage during all seasons of the year. You take such care to maybe even cover it up if there's any chance that something could fall on it or sap could get on it or a bird could do something on it. And you do your very best to keep it pristine. And then uh, little Johnny or Susie gets a key and thinks he wants to say, I love you, Daddy. And so he carves it into the side of your vehicle. You know, if that which brings you pleasure is your vehicle, even a kind gesture like that is going to bring some conflict. Listen, show me what brings you pleasure, and I will show you what brings you conflict. Listen, <clears throat> we, we take oftentimes such great pleasure, and we place such great of a priority on tailoring our lives to accomplish specific purposes that when anyone or anything stands between us and what brings us pleasure, a war is going to happen. You know, here in this passage, he is essentially saying, listen, what brings the wars out in your life? The problem can often be seen as the other person, but I'd like to argue that the problem is in your heart. The problem isn't the problem that that person is bringing into your life. The problem is, is that the presupposition of your life is that I am here for me and to accomplish the purposes that I have set out to accomplish. And so if my spouse stands in the way of me getting what I want to get, I throw a fit. If my children stand in the way of me getting what I want to get, I throw a a fit. If my co-worker stands in the way of me getting what I want to get out of life, I throw a fit. Listen, the pursuit of pleasure always leads to conflict. Listen, this can also happen in a church. You know, sometimes I think folks, they gather together and they worship and they have, they come into a church with a particular set of goals in mind for that church, not as a leader in the church, but just as a member of a church. And they can come into a church and they can think, you know what, I'm going to church because I want to feel a particular feeling during the song service. And if I don't feel that particular feeling during the song service because they're not doing it the way that I want them to do it, I'm going to throw a fit. That might be pulling the pastor aside in the office. He hasn't told me about anything like this, so don't think if, if the shoe fits, wear it, but I'm not preaching based on any prior knowledge here tonight. You pull the pastor aside and say, you know what, pastor, I really think it'd be a whole lot better if we introduce such and such a kind of music into our church. You know what, Pastor, I'd really like it if our church wasn't quite so stuffy and formal. You know what, Pastor, I think we just ought to lower the bar in this area, in that area. You know what, Pastor, I really, I'd really like to see our church maybe uh, get a Bible I can understand a little bit more. Or I'd really like to see our church, you fill in the blank of whatever your little hobby horse is. And you know, I think sometimes we have these things in mind that if we could just have our way in this area or that area, then everything would be just fine. Then I could be truly fulfilled and satisfied in life. Listen, I think we see this in even little children. I'm talking to some little kids right here in this room. And you know what? I find that oftentimes even I think we unwittingly train our children to live for pleasure. You think about it, listen, I understand that little kids are going to play and little kids are going to have fun. 
But you know what can often happen? The kids get in our hair, they get in our way, and maybe the, the little children are, are being just, you know, children. Children are going to be children. And so what we do is when we feel like they're getting in our hair, we tell them, why don't you just go play with your Legos? Why don't you just go play outside. What, listen, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Legos, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with playing outside, but so often, because we are selfish, we funnel our children towards some matter of pleasure. And it's like our children get the idea that life is about doing what pleases me. It can come out in all kinds of different ways. You know, whenever our children are kind of in our hair, we just throw the phone in front of them and put YouTube on for them or Disney Plus or Netflix. If you want your children to be groomed, you'll do that. But um, we, uh, we oftentimes, we think, you know what? Oh, man, you know what? Uh, my kids, they need something to do. They need something to do. So I'm going to give them some fun books to read, right? And let them really enjoy themselves. Listen, my kids, they've got Kindles because our axles couldn't handle all of the books that my children could consume. All right, my kids, my older two particularly, are voracious readers. I can give them a 250-page book on their Kindle, and they will be through it in two to three hours. Unbelievable speed readers. But you know what can happen? Even in something that I think all of us would say is a good thing, reading. It's good for your children to read. It can be something which brings them pleasure and something they live for. Right. You know, I find for some folks, they live for the next video game. They just live for it. They save, they spend all of their time and all of their resources, right? Listen, I'll be honest with you, the very first job I ever had was cutting lawns. And you want to know why I stepped out of my home and went around the neighborhood to cut people's lawns? Because I wanted to save up for a stupid video game. I remember the first check I ever got from a lady. I looked at the lady uh, right outside of her storm door and I said, I want you to know what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to cash it and I'm going to go home and I'm going to buy this particular video game I've been saving up for. And you know what? It was the foundation of my effort in that matter of labor. Why do you work a job? Do you work a job so that you can um, provide for your home? I hope you do. Do you work a job? Listen, working a job is a necessity. I understand that. If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. We shouldn't be lazy. We shouldn't be just, uh, 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 just, uh, uh, just sucking off of other people. We ought to work for ourselves. We ought to labor with our own hands, doing that which is good. And yet, why is it that we work? Why is it that we seek to make money. You know, I find sometimes the job is just a means to an end. And the end is to get what you want to get out of life. The purpose for the paycheck isn't just to supply for your family. Maybe the reason why you push a little harder, it's so that you can improve your life in such and such a way that you think is just going to bring you such great pleasure. Maybe the reason why you push a little bit harder and stay at the office a little bit longer is so that you can do that particular vacation that you've been dreaming about doing ever since since you were newly married. Maybe the reason why you push a little harder, the reason why you scrimp and why you save is so that you can finally make that large purchase that you've just been dying to purchase. Oh, you've done all the research. You've looked up all the reviews and you've found something that is finally going to satisfy your soul. Listen, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that it's wrong to save up for something. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to improve your life. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to have goals and to incrementally work towards them. But what I'm saying is that I believe many times Christians in good independent Baptist churches have as a foundation of their life. It's why they do what they do. It's why they say what they say. It's why they expend labor not to please God, but to fulfill 
their dreams. What do you dream of accomplishing in your life? What do you hope and pray and want and work towards? Is it to get that guy or that girl? Is it to get that position or that possession? Why do you want that position or that possession? Is it because you want other people to look at you and say, oh, look at him, he's got one of those, wow. Is that what brings you pleasure? Is it because you want that position so everyone will listen to what you have to say and you'll be the well-respected person in the workplace or in the church? What is it that brings you pleasure in your life? Because show me what brings you pleasure and I'll show you what brings you conflict. Listen, I believe that though folks come to church and though at times they will sacrifice for the cause of Christ deep down inside, it is a compartmentalized priority of their life. But if you were to get to what they're really living for, it's not to bring glory to God. It's not to bring souls to Jesus. It's not to please their Savior. It's to get what they want to get out of life. Church sometimes, I think, can even be a means to that end. Church and, dare I even say, Bible college. Coming to a Tuesday night service at a revival meeting. You want to be thought of in a certain way. You want to find the key that just makes your life much easier in the Christian life that somehow unlocks and makes things just so much better so that you can get past these feelings. I even think sometimes even the whole concept of getting victory over sin can be about me so that I don't have to live with this guilt, so that I can be free to live the way I want to live without that guilt hanging over my head. Listen, I really do believe that this whole hedonistic idea that the whole purpose of life is to experience as much pleasure as possible has really crept into the hearts of believers like you and believers like me. You know, here in the text... He, he's starting with a universal experience that we've all experienced, this matter of wars and fightings. And I don't think he's talking about wars like Ukraine and whatever you think is happening over there. I don't think he's talking about fightings in the sense of professional wrestling or anything like that. He's talking about when people get in our way and we just plow over them. He's talking about that peak that we talked about, that, that, that rise in our spirit when we don't get what we want to get out of life. Listen, the pursuit of pleasure will always lead to conflict. But, but let's continue reading. Verse number two, he, he carries his argument a little bit further. He says this, he says, ye lust and have not. So here you are, you have these desires, and if the truth were to be told, we have our dreams and our aspirations. We have these things that we want to bring pleasure to our lives, but if we're honest with ourselves, do we ever really get what we're after? I mean, really? Do we ever really experience the ideal that we're pressing towards? And I think all of us, if we've been around at all, we understand, especially the older we get in life, that as much as we might pursue happiness and true satisfaction through X, Y, or Z, once we get it, it's never good enough, and it never quite supplies what we're after. He says, ye lust and have not... Then we bring in the whole conflict into it. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not. 
You know, you know, friends, I, I just want to say that not only does the pursuit of pleasure lead to conflict, it also always leads to disappointment. You know, um, when we live for pleasure, when we live for that which brings us happiness, we will never get what we want. The position will never be good enough. If the foundation for our pursuit of a relationship is to bring pleasure to me, we'll never get the pleasure that we're after. If our desire to just have that particular possession is to make me happy. The possession will never truly make me happy the way I want it to. Oh, don't get me wrong. It'll make you happy for a little while. Don't get me wrong. There is that initial lift as the dopamine squirts into your brain and makes you feel like you've really made a great purchase. And then, of course, buyer's remorse shortly later because you spent so much money on it. Okay, there are going to be times where you get yourself into a relationship you think is going to make you feel all these amazing feelings. And maybe you might feel those feelings at the beginning. But mark my words, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, if you're pursuit was pleasure that pleasure will vain will wane the bible even tells us that the the pleasures of sin only last for a season and while it's new it might make you happy when it becomes mundane it will not bring you the pleasure you originally thought it would bring you listen i believe that many marriages have been murdered by one or both partners living for the pursuit of pleasure. Oh, she might have seemed like she would bring you great pleasure when you were in college. She might seem like she'd knock your socks off and be the woman of your dreams, but you get married. And listen, stuff happens. People don't look like they did when they were in college for the rest of their lives, right? And listen, at the beginning, you might have had these great aspirations and you might have thought, man, this is going to bring everything. But let, let me tell you what, the moment she, if your whole purpose was to bring yourself pleasure, the moment she stops bringing you pleasure, you look for another thing to bring you pleasure. I think a lot of times... Men, they get to a certain point and they realize maybe their wife isn't going to bring them the pleasure that they thought she would, and so they seek pleasure in their job. They seek accomplishment, success, fame, notoriety. And maybe they get to a point where they realize maybe there is no further pathway for an advancement and it's not all it's cracked up to be. So maybe they shift from the, the, the pursuit of pleasure when it comes to accomplishment and they shift instead to the pursuit of pleasure through purchases and things. And maybe it's their home and they think, man, if I could just make my home big enough, man, if I can just, you know, get, uh, get, get that particular car or that particular plane or whatever it is that they're just seeking after what I'm trying to get you to see is that the problem is not the purchase. The problem is not the job. The problem is not the relationship. The problem is the presupposition underneath it all. If God doesn't bring us the pleasure we're looking for, listen, God's not here to bring you pleasure. And unfortunately, there are Bible teachers who say that the whole purpose of our lives is just to find pleasure in God. And listen, don't, I, I'm not necessarily going to totally argue with that, but I just think it's the whole wrong way to phrase the argument. Listen, we do need to find our satisfaction in God. He needs to be our all in all. He needs, he is the very reason why we were created. But I think it's for us to bring him pleasure. Listen, if what we live for is pleasure, we will always instead find disappointment. Listen, I'm not saying that recreation is wrong. I'm not saying that it's wrong to enjoy your family. I'm not saying that it's wrong to enjoy good things. 
God wants to give good things to them that ask him. I'm not arguing for us to live asceticism, okay, where we try to deprive ourselves of everything to try to achieve some greater spiritual experience. I'm not saying that we need to all become monks and go to some monastery or nunnery in order to truly achieve what God wants us to achieve. But what I'm saying is this, if the core motivation of our lives is pleasure, we will find ourselves in constant conflict and constant disappointment. Let's continue reading. He makes this statement at the end of verse number two. He says, yet ye have not because ye ask not. And I think there's a certain sense in which that phrase does sort of hint to us at the solution. Listen, our, our purpose in being here is not to secure pleasure for ourselves. God does want us to experience pleasure, but God wants to be the one who gives those good gifts. God wants to be the source, not the means. And when we come to God, listen, oftentimes I think what, what really gets us off is the foundation for our life is, is pleasure. We want to get that which makes us happy. And instead of going to the Lord about it, instead we just go out to get it on our own. Let me put it to you this way. Um, there are some times that a young lady goes to Bible college, and I think that's a good thing. I'm not going to argue against that. I know different people have different takes on, on, on young ladies going to Bible college, and I'm not going to necessarily address any of those. But, you know, sometimes it's kind of the joke, right? A young lady goes to Bible college. Why does she go to Bible college? For her MRS degree. You know what I'm talking about? You know what the MRS degree, right, is? You know what MRS stands for? Mrs right? And so the kind, of, the kind of the joke is, you know, the young lady, she goes off to Bible college to find a husband. And I'll be honest with you, I'd rather find a husband in a Bible college than in a bar. I'd rather find, I, I'm not looking for a husband, but you know what I'm saying here. <laughs> I'd rather my daughter find a husband in Bible college than to find one on a dating site on the internet. I'd rather have my daughter find a husband in Bible college than to find him on Facebook, okay? Uh, and yet, sometimes I wonder, why did they really go there? I think sometimes young men, they can go to Bible college, and yes, they want to serve the Lord, but they're also looking all around, trying to find someone who brings them pleasure. And as much as sure they study for their tests in their off time and their downtime and their discretionary time, oh, they're looking around. Their radars are up and looking. Where's the prettiest girl? Where's the girl that's going to pay attention to me? Where's the girl that's going to bring me pleasure and make me happy? And I fear sometimes Folks, don't ask God and don't seek God. Follow, follow my reasoning here. Because they don't want to know what God has to say. You see, you have not because ye ask not. I think time, sometimes we think about this verse and we think, well, if we would just ask, God would give, right? I mean, sometimes we don't have because we don't ask. And I think that is definitely uh, the meaning of this verse. But, but just follow me. If we know God doesn't want it, we're not going to ask him. Right? If we know that this is not the will of God, or at least it's not God's way, and yet we really want it anyway, well, of course, we're not going to talk to him. In fact, we're going to leave God out of the loop entirely. You know, I think at that point, when the foundation for your life is the pursuit of pleasure, what can happen is instead of going to the Lord for his will and his best, instead, we manipulate. We play with people. We say things so that they'll do stuff for us 
And uh, in the context of even guy-girl relationships, I think girls can begin to dress a little differently just to grab the eyes of the guys. Guys can end up interacting with the girls and maybe a little bit more than they normally would. You know, you go, you sit at the all-girls table, right? Yes, I'm preaching to the college guys. All right, they're here. I can't help but preach to them. And they find themselves interacting with the girls maybe a little more than they normally would have because deep down inside, they want pleasure. They want somebody to please them. And instead of truly seeking God and waiting on God, they go to get it for themselves. You have not because ye ask not. And, and I've got a point I'm going to make here. I'm just trying to lead us to it inductively. He says, ye ask and receive not. Sometimes we do come and we ask. Sometimes we do and we bring our desires and our requests and our requests before the Lord. And sometimes we do. We say, God, I really want this. Oh, God, would you give me this? Oh, God, I want that car. Oh, God, I want that guy. Oh, God, I want that job. Oh, God, I want that position. And yet, deep down inside, the reason why we want it is because it will bring us pleasure. It will please me. See, either we do the end run around to get what we want and we ignore God entirely or we try to manipulate God into giving us what we want. Do you see how in both cases when we ignore God or when we try to twist God's arm, the foundation is still, we want what we want. We want that which is going to bring us pleasure. The point that I'm making here, listen, if you live your life for the pursuit of pleasure, not only will you experience conflict, not only will it always bring disappointment, but it will always lead you away from the will of God. Always. Always. Instead of seeking God and submitting to him and bringing it before him. We just try to go and get it ourselves. And pray, instead of praying and seeking God, we claw and manipulate to get what we want. Do you pray about whether to make that large purchase or do you just go out and do it because you have the money? Do you truly play, pray about that person at school or do you just make eyes and flirt with her with the hopes that it might end up sticking? Do you find yourself just constantly pushing all day long to get your way or do you actually bow the knee to God and seek his face? See, often what we're after is not God's will. What we're after is not God's plan. What we're after instead is doing what we want to do right now. Sometimes all we want to be is happy and healthy. We just want to feel good. And even though James definitely tells us to pray for the sick later on in the book, sometimes I think even our praying about our health is because we just want to feel good again. I'm not arguing against praying for health needs. That is biblical. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying, why do we do what we do? Listen, he, he, he talks about our lusts, this matter of that something or someone that makes us happy. When that is the foundation of our life, when that is the presupposition underlying every priority and every decision of our lives, we will be in constant conflict with people. We will never get what we're after. We will find ourselves far away from God because what God wants is different than what I want. What it will end up leading us to is finding our fulfillment in the enemy of God. Look at the next verse. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know, 
Um, if I was to just walk up to you in the hallway and say, hi, adulterer, that may be one of those offenses that get lodged in your soul we talked about last night. You know what I'm talking about? And, you know, for James to just throw this out there, we are so familiar with Scripture and verses and words that we can miss the impact of these things. James has been arguing that the foundation of your life should not be what you want. And he says that when it is the case, I am going to tell you what you are. You're adulterers and adulteresses. Because ultimately, when we don't find our satisfaction, when we don't find the pleasure, the happiness that we're seeking for in God, we will find it somewhere. And I want you to know the system that is longing to fulfill that lust for pleasure is the system designed by the devil that is in complete opposition to God. I'm, I'm going to get on your front doorstep here for just a second. Do you seek satisfaction in your social media feed? Do you seek satisfaction in your YouTube feed? Listen, when you are just looking to, you know, kill some time and when you maybe are hurting and you're just looking for an outlet to make you feel better, do you turn to the streaming platform, Disney Plus? Listen, do you turn to Netflix? Do you turn to HBO Max, whatever they might be? Do you turn to your television? Do you turn to the movies? Do you turn to the games on your phone? Listen, I want you to know that when it comes to, listen, this is not even, listen, I hope we don't even need to argue about this, but you do realize that companies like Disney and Netflix are literally the spearhead of the world to get into your heart and to get into your home. Listen, I shouldn't have to tell you that Disney literally has said that their desire is to desensitize your children to that which God calls an abomination. It is their stated purpose. And listen, I know we can all say, but not Bambi. I know we can all say, well, you know, but that, that we just watch the old movies. We don't watch the new movies. Listen, I know what it's like when you pull up the homepage of Disney Plus to look for the oldies and the goodies, so to speak. And you know what they're filling your eyes full of? The newies and the baddies. Listen, some of the new stuff they've been coming out with, while they might not have a cuss word in them, I think, unfortunately, that becomes our... Our, our, our threshold for that which is godly and good. They are, listen, I cannot think of something that epitomizes the world more than the Hollywood industry. And yet we tolerate it. And we let our kids watch it on a regular basis. We let our kids' brains be filled full of the philosophies of this world. We let our kids' brains be filled. And listen, we, they, they, they go to these, th they, they watch these movies. Listen, by the way, there used to be givens in independent Baptist churches like you don't go to the movie theater. That used to be a given. When I grew up, it was a family rule and a church rule that Christians do not go to the movie theater. That is, listen, if movies and Hollywood I, I told you I'm going to get on your front porch here today. If movies and Hollywood are the spear tip of the world, which is the system the devil has designed to cause God's people to commit adultery against God Almighty, why do we go to his temple? Because what else would you call the cinema than his temple? Listen, the, the, listen, the temples in pagan times are places where they would go to do things with temple people. I'm trying to be careful because of the kids, all right, but you catch my drift. To do things with bad ladies and men at the temple to fulfill their lusts there in worship to that false God. How much more is not the very temple to the world, the Hollywood industry, the place where we go to commit adultery against God.
Listen, you might say, we're just going to watch whatever the latest Finding Nemo movie is. Surely there's nothing wrong with that. Listen, unfortunately, even Pixar's turning out stuff that is ungodly and wicked if you really look at the foundations of it. And you know, we might say, oh, it's innocent. Oh, ha, ha, ha. That joke was put in there for the adults. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, 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 ha. Listen, I'll tell you what. The system, the cosmos of the devil was designed to get you to want it because it brings you pleasure. Listen, I'm going to tell you what a healthy diet of movies and entertainment is a training plan that you are putting your children on to teach them that life is about pursuing pleasure. And I would argue it is spiritual adultery against God Almighty. It's interesting, the end of verse number four, he says, whosoever therefore will be. You might not catch this from at first glance, but the idea of that will be isn't just future tense. It's actually wants to be. Whoever has it in their heart, whoever has the desire of their soul is, I want to be a friend of the world. I want to have that relationship of appreciation between me and what the world and its system has to offer. He says, whoever desires to have that ministry of affinity with the world is taking sides against God Almighty. When we live our life for the pursuit of pleasure, we find ourselves in conflict and disappointment. We find ourselves being led away from the will of God, and we find ourselves committing spiritual adultery. But that's not how God wants it. Verse 5, I'm going I'm to end with this verse here. He makes a statement, Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? I've done a lot of reading on that verse, done a lot of studying, and uh, there are a couple of opinions as to what the spirit in that verse is talking about. But I want to give you my best take on this, and I really do believe, given the context, it is the right take. Listen, this spirit that God has placed inside of us, I do not believe, is the human spirit. While you might uh, wonder why it uses the word lust, I think it's using the word lust because of the picture of adultery that was stated in the verse before. Here's the idea of this. Just like you have things that you want to get out of life, just like you have desires and things that you are pursuing in your life, I want you to know that God also has has a desire as well. God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. And he is jealous to have you and to have all of you to himself. Listen, the Holy Spirit does not want to share you any more than you want to share your husband, ladies, with another woman. The Holy Spirit wants complete, total, exclusive rights to you. He does not want you to be pursuing something other than him. Listen, here in this passage... James is arguing to a group of people that are in very difficult situations. They're scattered abroad in contexts that are foreign to them. They're experiencing hurt and trial. God is trying to do something in their lives, and yet in the midst of the pressure cooker, it's so easy for them to seek a release valve through trying to get some pleasure out of life. And he's arguing throughout this entire book, do not pursue pleasure. That's what selfishness does instead of pursuing that which brings you pleasure you need to pursue God why do you do what you do why do you make the choices that you make in your life do you do them because they make you happy or do you do them because they're a part of your 
absolute surrender and loyal devotion to God Almighty. We might look, listen, I'm, I'm out of time here tonight. I've gone longer than I intended to here this evening. I'll just make this point. In order to break the pattern of the pursuit of pleasure, it requires humility and submission. We're going to say more about this later on in the week, but I do want to mention this here at this point. He says in verse number six, but he giveth more grace. God's grace is the solution to breaking the chains that the pursuit of pleasure can have around our lives. He says this grace is more than enough to break any thought pattern, any habit, any presupposition that may have ruled your life up to the present moment. But it says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Listen, friends, humility admits that God knows better than me. Humility admits that I can't, but God can. And humility is willing to submit to the authority of God Almighty. It is willing to place oneself under him to deal with sin, to deal with motives, and to come clean with God. Humility says, God, it's not about me. It's all about you. Selfishness. Selfishness lives for the pursuit of pleasure. But love lives for the pursuit of God. 